This talk is going to be an introduction to the concept of emulators. How they work, how they are designed and how you can try making your own emulators as an exercise in programming. So what is an emulator? Wikipedia defines an emulator as hardware or software that enables one computer system to behave like another computer system. So an emulator is basically a program that is used to run other programs designed for other machines. In the context of my talk here, I am solely going to speak about hardware emulation of retro video game consoles. So essentially we are writing software that mimics the behavior of the console and allows us to play games intended for those consoles in our personal computers. At first I will be explaining everything with the example of the Nintendo Game Boy since it is one of the most iconic gaming consoles of all time. Once we cover a bird's eye view of emulation, we will see how we can get started with writing emulators and why it is a good programming exercise. Talking about the Game Boy, it was first released in the year of 1989 by Nintendo in Japan. Although less sophisticated compared to its competitors at the time, Nintendo has sold over 200 million copies combined from all the Game Boy models. The games intended for the Game Boy and other similar consoles came in cartridges called Game Packs. These game packs contained the necessary circuitry to store the game's program logic in a read-only memory chip. When inserted into the Game Boy console, the Game Boy processor, which we will get into in a moment, reads the program from the chip and executes it, thus starting the game. In the context of emulation, in order to run this game designed for the Game Boy in another device, say our laptop, we need to first get the contents of the game pack. The contents of the read-only memory of the game pack are read to create ROM files, which is essentially the code for running a Game Boy game. This game code will contain instructions from the instruction set of the Game Boy architecture and the size of the ROM file varies according to the game. For example, Tetris has only 32 kilobytes of data, while Pokemon Crystal is about 2 megabytes. Now that we have the actual program that we need to run in our computer, we need to see how we can execute this program in the same way a Game Boy would execute it. It is at this point we need to start looking into the internal architecture of the Game Boy hardware. If you are into electronics, you would have encountered microprocessor architectures and would be familiar with all of this. Essentially, a CPU has several components which makes it tick, like the registers and the primary memory or the RAM to store temporary data and an arithmetic and logic unit to perform operations on this data. In the physical device, we are implementing this with circuits made up of logic gates with flip-flops storing bits of data and adder circuits doing operations on binary numbers and all that. But when writing an emulator, we are implementing the entire hardware architecture with software. So instead of the physical registers inside the CPU, our emulator program will have a few global variables representing each of the registers. Instead of a physical circuit of the ALU, we can just implement all of the functionalities of the ALU as functions which takes these registers as their arguments and modify their contents. In a similar fashion, we can create other peripherals of the console like the keypad, the monitor and the sound system. The working of all of these involves reading and writing from certain registers in the CPU. They might also need to keep some internal state as well. For example, the keypad might have an internal state to check if a button is pressed or not and depending on this internal state, it might change the value in one of the CPU memory locations. In the case of a monitor, the 160 by 144 pixel screen of the Game Boy can be represented within an HTML canvas or any other equivalent method and the pixels can be updated according to the changes occurring in the memory of the CPU. So if you are working with the object oriented programming paradigm, uh, you can create a class for each of the CPU and the peripherals and link them together. Once we define all the internal architectural details like the registers and the functionalities of the ALU and lay down the rules of how data can be transferred and processed in between these elements and with the peripherals, our software defined CPU is starting to take shape. Now that we have a bare bones structure of the CPU, we need to define what to do with the ROM file. The CPU needs to be able to read the ROM file instruction by instruction, decode what the instruction means and then do the necessary processing that each of the instruction defines. This is same as the normal fetch decode execute cycle in microprocessors. And in our emulator, we write code to account for each of the instruction in the entire instruction set of the Game Boy architecture and what to do when each of these instructions are encountered. 
you can refer the instruction set of the device usually represented in the form of an opcode table where all the instructions their operands and the operation involved are described to great detail once we program what to do with all the instructions and define how fast the instructions must be read and processed we can run this program with the rom file as the input and our emulator should hopefully read and execute the game from the rom file so that has been a bird's eye view of what emulation is in general and it must have been quite a bit to digest if you're unfamiliar with the electronics involved like the processor architecture and all that so if you would like to get into emulator development a good place to start would be the chipage system the chipage system includes many of the famous retro games like tetris pacman breakout and such chipage is also an ideal place to start building your first retro console emulator since it is a really simple system with only 32 opcodes in the instruction set meaning that you can finish writing the entire emulator within an afternoon if you are familiar with programming and a bit of electronics or within one or two days if you are just getting started with these the input and output peripherals of the chipage system are also fairly simple with the display being a grid of 64 by 32 pixels which can either be on or off meaning that you can easily program them with a simple array representing the state of the display The sheer number of tutorials and guides for learning and building with the chipage system also makes it worthy of the perfect beginner project. Now with all that out of the way, let us conclude this quick talk with why you should try building an emulator. The reason you might want to get into this nerdy hobby might be different for each of you. For some it might be the nostalgia associated with old games they played as children, while for some others it might be the programming challenge involved in getting all the parts of the emulator to work together. Whatever your motivation might be, emulator development is a fun and highly rewarding hobby where you can learn a whole lot about programming and how computer hardware works in general. I really hope that you found this talk interesting and that it inspires you to try building an emulator on your own.